Um, it's ob it, obvious that it's never been easier to sell and buy things online. In recent years, both small and large American businesses have seen the benefits of reaching millions of global customers. But the question is, are our policies and regulations keeping pace with the times? So to help answer that question, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage Congressman Darren LaHood of, from Illinois, member of the House and Ways uh, Means and Means Committee, and co-chair of the Digital Trade Caucus. And joining him, of course, will be Semaphore's own uh, editor-at-large, Steve Clemens. Steve, over to you. I am on. I'm on there. Uh, Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. You know, our, I think our job today, besides looking out over this great, you know, uh, overcast scene, but it is beautiful, um, is I want to have a discussion about what the topography of commerce, trade, the digital dimensions of it ought to be in America. Um, you know, sometimes they think, you know, you know, realists always say, let's look at things as they are. But I kind of want to ask you, where does e-commerce and trade fit in the profile of our economy and are we doing it well enough is it healthy enough what's your view well first of all steve thanks for having me and congratulations to semaphore on your launch and uh pleasure to be with all of you here today uh thanks for the opportunity to visit with you a little bit um uh, i'm proud to be the the co-chair of the digital trade caucus along with susan del benny of, of washington and we both serve on the ways and means committee and as we look at, uh, you know, e-commerce and, and the digital space, obviously uh, massive growth has occurred in both of those realms. And as we look at COVID, obviously there was a lot of challenges and disruptions with COVID, but there was a lot of, uh, you know, growth that came out of COVID in the digital side and, and obviously in e-commerce. Uh, you know, uh, businesses adapted and they changed and they worked around regulations depending on what state you were in but you, you saw this massive expansion there. And I guess from my perspective, as we look at the free market system, we, we have wonderful companies and businesses engaged in, in these spaces. And so, um, you know, I'm of the opinion that industries ought to self-regulate themselves when there are issues and government ought to step in when they can't do that. Mm. And so as we have this debate about what we should be doing or not doing, uh, we always got to think about how is the free market system doing in these spaces? Tremendous, uh, you know, as you look at technology and innovation, it's amazing, Steve, to see what's being done in that space right now uh, in both of those uh, massive amounts of growth there. And so, you know, uh, I think um, we lead the world in many ways on where we're going with that. And so it's a balance that we have on the Digital Trade Caucus. I will also say one thing that we do on the Digital Trade Caucus is um, we have a, a great group of bipartisan members and their staffs. We educate them on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. Congresswoman Del Benny and I uh, have a, a monthly event we do with members just to update them on what's going on, right? Uh, members of Congress have busy lives, but the Digital Trade Caucus has been extremely so, helpful. So do they, so when I work for Senator Jeff Bingaman, who is a Democrat from New Mexico, he's a big believer in, in digital commerce, but he said, you know, we can't just do digital commerce amongst ourselves and between Rio Rancho and, and Las Cruces, it's like doing each other's laundry and hoping the economy is going to grow. We, 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 you know, we need to basically connect to the outside world and be connected to the global world. And he was a big, big proponent um, in the, in, you know, 25 years ago of the digital platforms and selling American products abroad. And so you know, I, I think there's tension in that story today, you know, between is this all about America or even just between America and Europe, or are we connecting to the rest of the world? How do you look at the global trade <laughs> adjunct to the digital commerce picture? Well, I'll, I'll mention uh, two observations. One, if you look at DSTs, digital, um, you know, digital taxes uh, from Europe, we're dealing with that right now. So what digital are they called? Service, DSTs, digital service taxes, okay. right? Um, and, and uh, you know, our European- And you love them, right? <laughs> I do not love them. <laughs> um, uh, and I should say, we do not love them. But it highlights uh, some of those problematic issues that we have with our like-minded allies on, you know, what is the right. appropriate level of tax that you do there? And so we've been going through this debate through the OECD process, but also with our allies on that. But that is going to continue to be problematic. Mm -hmm. But I will also say, uh, if you look at what we did in USMCA on the digital trade chapters, right. um, really remarkable, and I call it kind of the gold standard for what we ought to look at. As we look at other trade agreements, because as we all know, we roughly make up 5% of the world's population, right? And so as we create more markets and more customers around the world, 
those chapters in USMCA, the digital trade chapters, and there's, there's two of them in there that I think are really, um, uh, again, the standard we ought to be looking at as we look at future trade agreements. Um, and and uh, there's been a few hurdles and wrinkles with the Mexicans and the Canadians, but overall it's worked very well. And remember, this was a bipartisan pass overwhelmingly in the House and Senate. And so uh, that gives me hope as we look at how do we create more markets and more customers. So I was just telling you offline that I ran into uh, then U.S. Trade Representative Bob Lighthizer and AFL-CIO President Richard Trumpka, the late Richard Trumpka, at Cafe Milano, of course, having a you know, quiet dinner and wine together and celebrating USMCA. And you know, I've heard both Republicans and Democrats talk about that that was one of the great moments of the Trump administration. That is a, but it sort of seems like trade fizzled out after that. I mean, what's happened, and, and, and are you, I mean, I know you're critical of the Biden team, but I mean, are you critical of trade kind of falling off the agenda after USMCA? Well, um, a couple of things. Uh, I, I didn't agree with everything Bob Lighthizer advocated for. I thought he did a very good job as the trade representative, probably a little bit too more, a little bit too protectionist for me. Mm-hmm. I'm not a big fan of tariffs, and, uh, and uh, tariffs to me are taxes, um, and they're taxes on businesses and consumers, and so... But I, I thought he uh, balanced it very, very well in terms of what was reality and, and how we could get it through the Congress. And I think the USMCA was a reflection of that. Um, and he, was a, uh, he had the authority within the Trump administration to negotiate these trade agreements. I think that's just the opposite under the Biden administration over the last two years, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. Our allies in the Indo-Pacific region, South Korea, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, they are craving our leadership there. And I think Ambassador Tai is um, a very smart and very capable trade ambassador, but I don't think she's been given the authority to do what needs to be done there. And so we are missing out on terms of, uh, of our leadership in the Indo-Pacific region. And so if, if you look at the last two years under the Biden administration, remember the Ways and Means Committee has sole jurisdiction over all trade issues. They have brought forth no new trade ideas, no new initiatives. If you look at IPEF, which is obviously their economic framework for the Indo-Pacific region. It's really non-binding, has no um, authority mechanism with it, um, and, and really doesn't focus on market access. And so as we look at the Republicans on the Ways and Means Committee, I serve on the Trade Subcommittee, I think you're going to see a very intentional, robust uh, trade agenda talking about why we don't have a trade agreement with um, Great Britain. After Brexit, that should have been easy right. to do. Uh, I think you'll see a focus on that. And then other areas, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, Congresswoman Kara Miller and I have a bill that focuses on China. How do we get with our like-minded rules-based systems in the Indo-Pacific region to focus on that? So that will be a part of our agenda. So go a little further on the China one. How do, you know, with $750 billion of trade, how do you get the China part of America's trade picture right and get people to embrace it? You're a new member of the Select Committee on China. And, and I know you're a pro-trade guy, and I'm just interested in, you know, even Gina Raimondo, who came in and said, you know, there are areas and chips, et cetera, we need to protect, but we need to sell a lot of American products to China, that big country. So is there anyone like you in Congress, or are you the only one who's no. basically saying, you know, trade matters for the country, even China? No, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, like-minded uh, colleagues that, uh, that, that take on this approach. But, but I would say on China, first of all, I'm glad Speaker McCarthy put this select committee on China competitiveness in place. As you saw on the House floor, we had over 100 Democrats that supported it. It truly will be bipartisan. Chairman Mike Gallagher will do an excellent job. And if you look at how we populated the committee, I think you have really substantive members on there that want to be engaged when it comes to China. But it's a balance with China, as as we all know. I mean, their middle class market of roughly 500 million my farmers sell a lot of corn and soybeans there. We sell a lot of Caterpillar products there. We sell a lot of John Deere products from my state of Illinois. So it's an important market. Um, but if you look at, particularly in the technology space, in the e-commerce space, China doesn't abide by the same rules and standards that every other industrialized country in the world does. Talk to anybody that works in Silicon Valley. And then th- that doesn't even encompass the theft of intellectual property uh, that China continues to engage. They're malign activities that that they're involved with. And so as we look at that, um, I also serve on the Intelligence Committee. And I I don't necessarily say this lightly, but China has a plan to replace us. Mm -hmm. And they're working at it every single day, diplomatically, militarily, economically, and technologically. So you're, you're one of the few people I know of who believes in global 
transnational institutions like the WTO to work these problems out and to pursue our trade interests, to get enforcement. You don't hear a lot of people saying, hey, we've got the WTO to kind of get China in line. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about how you can, can both raise questions about Chinese trade behavior, but at the same time, you've got you know, some confidence in the institutions to do that. And are we, is the Biden administration doing what it should to make the WTO work? Well, the, the WTO needs massive reform. Uh, we, we, there's a number of bills introduced in a bipartisan way in the Ways and Means Committee to do that. That will be part of our uh, agenda on the Trade Subcommittee, and it should be. I use the example often that when China was brought into the World Trade Organization in 2001, the argument at the time was bring China in, they're gonna modernize, they're gonna become more westernized, they're gonna become more democratic, and they're gonna liberalize their economy and there are some examples of where that has worked, but there's massive uh, evidence that it has not worked the way that it is, that they are not abiding by, again, the same rules and standards that, have, that every other industrialized country in the world does. In the ag space, I use the example, we have had 22 cases against China in the WTO in the ag space. We've won 19 of them. Mm. We're about ready to win a 20th. So, you know, they continue to, to not uh, fulfill, I think, uh, the the expectations that everybody thought in that. And so as we look at how do we reform the WTO, and by the way, it's not just us, mm. it's it's many of our uh, allies in Europe and elsewhere that have real concerns about uh, China. The fact that China is still treated in some ways in the WTO, WTO as a third world country uh, is wrong. And so um, getting that right balance uh, is part of what the Select Committee on China will look at. And it's not just on the economic side, we're obviously looking at national security issues, we're looking at human rights, we're looking at forced labor issues in Xinjiang, uh, all very relevant issues. I, I, you know, if you went back 20 years ago in Congress, it used to be you had uh, kind of three different groups related to China. You had the economic hawks, you had the human rights hawks, and you had the uh, uh, national, uh, national security, economic, and uh, human rights hawks. They've all found each other now. Uh, and, and so you, you have a much more adversarial approach to China, and I think that's reflected in this new select committee. So it is a balance on terms of how we deal with China. With We are economically intertwined at many different levels. But I would argue, you know, those are companies that have been in China for 40 or 50 years. Like I'll use the example of, of Caterpillar, great American company. I have the largest- There were big, big investors in China. Yeah. I have the largest concentration of Caterpillar workers anywhere in the world in my district. Mm. Uh, Caterpillar has 29 manufacturing plants in China, four R&D facilities, and they've mm. been there for 40 years. So they're embedded. And there's lots of companies that are that, but it's the new companies, it's the technology right. companies, the Silicon Valley companies, the e-commerce companies mm -hmm. that are treated completely differently uh, in terms of how China deals with them. And that's the problem that we, that's part of the problem that we need to deal with. So next Tuesday, I mean, something remarkable, remarkable to me, I don't know if you know, the, the Germans and French pretend to hang out, but they really don't hang out that much together. And, and the German and French finance ministers are teaming up to come to Washington hand in hand to basically, in my view, um, sort of nudge uh, Congress and the White House on the IRA as being a protectionist vehicle yeah. that is harming them. Would love to get your thoughts on that. And while they're here together, what would you like them to hear on digital service taxes? <laughs> um, well, on the first point, on the IRA, IRA um, I, I did obviously did not support that. I think there's some provisions in there that I think are, are good for the country. But the protectionist measures that are related to the IRA, I think there's real issues and real problems with that, particularly as it relates, again, if we, if we want to be a true free trader and we want to work with our allies and, and we want to have that uh, relationship there, I think there's some real concerns there that they'll continue to raise. And it's, you know, it's allies in the Indo-Pacific region there. In terms of DSTs and, and I mean, we went round and round with our European allies on this uh, mm -hmm. in terms, I mean, we lead the world in technology in terms of our platforms and, and, and they are uh, used throughout Europe and, and, and the world. But I think, uh, you know, I think it is going to be detrimental and really hurt our uh, ability to continue to expand and prosper and innovate if we don't get this right. Uh, but it's it's going to continue to be a, 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 a battle between uh, between them on this. How literate? I mean, you talk about Susan Del Bene, whom I um, have interviewed many, many times. So I'm just interested in the literacy level of your colleagues on trade. And, you know, it used to be in the 90s that the overwhelming 
uh, push in, particularly the Republican Party, was that you know America's global standing was enhanced by trade. Trade deals, be, you know, came left and right, um, and there were folks on the Democratic side that were you know big pro trade. That sort of largely dissipated, and and now it fascinates me that you're coming back to people to try and educate the members and their staff people on the benefits on trade, on e-commerce, on the fact that lots of American jobs and small businesses are, you know, that their welfare and, and, and uh, uh, success is tied to, to trade. C tell us just a little bit about that. Like, you know, is that a, a big uphill climb for you or are you finding that there's some muscle memory in the back that people used to be sort of pro-trade? Well, I think you got to distinguish. And you, I mean, you do understand there are not a lot of Republicans that share your views. Well, right? I, yeah. I, I think there's more than you would think, Steve, mm. in terms of when you lay it out. When you talk about why uh, overwhelming amount of Republicans supported uh, USMCA, mm. I think. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think when you look at the evidence and how beneficial that has been mm -hmm. to producers here, whether it's in the ag space or manufacturing space or the automotive space. It's been extremely successful. So I think you got to talk about those things, and, and that's part of what we'll right, do. Right. Um, you know, w when it comes to e-commerce and digital, I, I mean, there is a lot that members don't understand, aren't involved with, uh, you know. And so, again, that's incumbent upon us to continue to educate them. I also would just say this, particularly all my Democrat colleagues, you know, the labor movement and the environmental movement has bogged down many of these trade agreements. And that's partly why this Biden administration hasn't been able to do anything for two years. Uh, again, I think Ambassador Tai has some great ideas, great relationships, has worked very hard to expand the trade footprint in the Indo-Pacific region, but has been hamstrung by uh, environmentalists in the labor movement. Uh, and I would go back to, I was an early supporter of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, not perfect. I would have wanted some changes to it. But again, it put us in a position where we wrote the rules of the road when it comes to the Indo-Pacific region with our like-minded allies to isolate. That has to be part of our select committee on China. How do we, we understand the military part uh, and, and, and the national security part, but we have to focus on the economic part on how we can, again, use our power and leverage uh, in that region to isolate China. I'm gonna take one quick question because we're getting right out of time. I may go to Paul London, who's like a smart columnist stuff. If you've got a question, Paul, but before I do that, let me ask you one other element of the e-commerce world that, that, you know, this may seem out of left field, but when I was at the Hill, we did a um, program with Aman Bhutani, who's the CEO of GoDaddy, and GoDaddy is one of the largest internet registrars uh, in the world. And they did a study on micro-businesses and how the thriving micro-businesses that had gone online during COVID, during times of stress, and if you're a part of the nation that has lots of these micro you know, businesses, which Aman would call side hustles sometimes, that would become big businesses, they proved to be more economically resilient. They got through you know, periods of economic stress better. But what was clear in dealing with the Small Business Administration, dealing with members of Congress, is it kind of was an area of economic activity flying beneath the radar screen of most public policy people. Are these micro businesses and this element of e-commerce, and even connecting globally, on your radar screen? And do you think we need to do more to sort of elevate attention to how we incubate, support, mentor a kind of new level of digital economic activity in the country? Well, the answer is yes. Really, government needs to get out of the way and let them prosper and thrive. I mean, that's, again, part of our free market system, the yeah. gig economy, e-commerce, right. digital. Yes, I mean, and, and that's, that's the future. And I think that sets us apart from, again, many of our allies around the world. And that technology advantage that we have here and that the, the, the immense amount of brain power we have and, and young people going into that, we got to continue. Again, I go, went back to my earlier point. You know, government staying out of the way and only getting involved when there needs to be proper regulation ought to be our approach. Great. I want to give the mic to Paul London here. Yeah. You got a question or comment? I know you always do. Right here. Can we get the mic back here, please? Paul is a columnist in the Hill. So go ahead. Is that mic on? Great. A little closer, Paul. And let's make it fast. All right. Yeah. His wife is Paula Stern, the former chair of the International Trade Commission. So, yeah.
And I wonder if you could talk about that. The old industries thrive? The, they drive the trade agenda. Okay, great. So the, he's saying the old industries drive the trade agenda more than the new industries. Is, there, is that true from your perspective, or does that need to be rethought? Yeah, well, I, I don't disagree with that, Paul, but I would say, but the new industries, particularly everything we talked about today, uh, you know, with, with technology and e-commerce uh, and the gig economy, I mean, that has just had a massive explosion. It's not going away. It's going to continue to prosper. So this is how you wrap your arms around kind of uh, how we've done traditional trade and adapt that to, you know, digital services. I mean, that, that's going to be right. the difficulty and the problem. That's part of why we have the Digital Trade Caucus and working on that. It's different from how we did that before and how you navigate that. Again, I go back to the digital trade chapter in USMCA uh, and, and how you have everything from cross-border flows to how you deal with different countries, how you regulate that, how you tax that, and how you have a, uh, a market system that allows the free enterprise system to prosper uh, is, is what we ought to be focused on. Easier said than done, but that is the future. Well, Congressman LaHood, thank you so much for your Thanks, ideas Steve. and thoughts this morning. Great to, great to see you, you. And everybody, go visit Peoria. All right, there you go. There you thank go. you so Thanks. much. All right, take care. Thank you.